So thank you very much, Mel. Um, so everyone will kick off right now. Um, for those I haven't met so far, my name's Ben Taylor. I'm uh, CEO of Wall and Shire Council, and I've got the, the pleasure of being your uh, host tonight. Um, so we've got a, a bit to go through in terms of the session, but before we kick off, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, to start, congratulations uh, on putting your hand up to represent the community on council, or even if you're thinking about it. Um, for me, I've got a lot of respect for people who, who put their hand up to represent um, represent the community on council. I think it's a it's a tough job. It can also be a really, really rewarding one. So congratulations on, on considering or even putting your hand up and nominating and putting your hand in the ring. Um, the focus of tonight's session is to provide you some background on council and, and the role of the mayor and the councillors. Uh, we'll go through some key points today for information and we'll have some time for questions as well. And I'll pause at key times during the presentation. So if you want to ask questions, there's a couple of options for you. Either you can type them in. So there's a chat box where you can type them in, uh, in which case our governance staff, uh, Lexi, will read them out for you. Otherwise, you can put up your hand. So there's an option there to put up your hand if you press one of the buttons uh, along the bottom of your screen. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, bring you in. So we'll say your name and we'll bring you in and you can ask your question on the screen and we'll endeavor, we'll do our best to answer it as best we can. Um, so uh, Mel, if you don't mind bringing up the presentation um, and we might kick off. Thank you very much. So uh, for tonight's councillor um, candidate information session, um, as I said, we're going to go through some key points of information. Um, first of all, uh, welcome. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, as I said, there'll be questions welcome throughout the, throughout the presentation. Um, if you'd like to ask them, put them in the chat box or put your hand up. Um, I did want to throw out there also an invitation. So um, we'll go through some information today and provide you a bit of background, but there's also the invitation for any candidate who's nominating for council, if they do want to have a one-on-one -on -one catch up with me, they're welcome to. Um, you just need to reach out to my office. Um, our contact details are on the website, reach out to my office um, and um, we'll make a time for you to come in and have a chat. Um, for me, the most successful councils are the ones where there's a strong working relationship between the CEO, the executive and the elected council. Um, and my role, as I see it, particularly over the next few months, is to prepare the organisation and and to really work in partnership with the incoming council so we can help you, um, the elected council, deliver on the priorities. Uh, next slide, please. So a brief introduction. Now, obviously, you all know um, that Wallandilly is a beautiful place. It's full of natural beauty. It has a warm and generous community. It has a rich history as well. Um, and to me, for, for someone who's coming relatively fresh to Wallandilly, I've been here for almost two years. Um, I really believe it's a land of opportunity and, and council's role really as custodians, the land is to, is to grab these opportunities with both hands uh, and make Wallandilly hopefully an even better place than it is today. Um, but you know also that we've got some big challenges ahead of us um, as the Shire grows and changes. You know, the population is growing now. Um, decisions made over the past 10 years mean that the population is growing and more people are moving in. Um, in towns and villages all over the Shire, from Silverdale to the Oaks, to Picton, Tarmore, Thirlby, and Dandabago. Um, and of course, we've got Wilton as well, which is growing before our eyes with more and more families moving in every day. Uh, and we also have some, some big challenges ahead with landowners pushing hard for further growth in Appen. You know, for me, um, Council's role in this growth journey is to shape it, uh, to work hard to create beautiful places and secure the infrastructure we need for our community, roads, public transport, schools, health services, the local, the local facilities like open space, sporting fields, community and aquatic centres, libraries. You know, the, our job really is to build community uh, and, to, and to create a way of life. So I think it's a real honour um, to work for council or to be a council law um, because you, you have that opportunity to really shape and build a community. So congratulations, as I said earlier, for putting your hand up um, and considering running for council. Now, this council, I think, has made some good progress um, on Wilton, for example, but really um, the next council term will be the, where the rubber hits the road and where the population does uh, increase dramatically. The other area, uh, in my view, that um, this incoming council has, as should have as its priority, is actually enhancing the organisation itself. So, um, as I said earlier, my role is to work in partnership with the council um, and to 
enhance the organization to improve its efficiency and do it in a financially sustainable way. Um, but, but more than anything, to set us up, set us up properly to successfully manage the growth that's that's upon us now. You know, our 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 priority really, our focus is creating a high performing organization and, and one that I think our community expects and deserves. Um, that'll need some investment. It'll need some critical thinking um, around better technologies, around efficiencies, around improved customer service, and also investment in operational facilities like new depots for our operational staff and offices for our office staff, because we'll need to grow the organization if we're really gonna effectively service our growing population. Another key challenge, I think, for, for the incoming council, and it's not all challenges, a lot of it's opportunities, but a, a key challenge is also the creation of local jobs. Uh, a whole lot of our population leaves the Shire, uh, and the creation of local jobs is, has been a key focus of this council, and I believe should be a key focus of the future council as well. Uh, my job is to lead the organisation on your behalf um, and to work with you, the elected council, if you're successful in getting elected, um, to make the most of the opportunities before us. Um, you know, for me, um, the way we deliver services is relatively straightforward. Um, I work with you, the executive works with you, the management team works with you as the elected council, if you're um, successful in getting elected, um, to set up um, what's called the community strategic plan, which is our 10 year plan for the, for the area, the four year delivery program and the one year operational plan. And these documents, uh, these plans will be developed in the first nine months of the new council. And it's these plans that will determine where we spend our funds, where we alloc allocate our resources. Um, the structure of these documents is built around uh, five key themes, which are there on your screen right now. So sustainable and balanced growth, the management and provision of infrastructure, caring for the environment, looking after the community and efficient and effective council. Now, would you mind going to the next slide for me, please? The council has approximately 300 staff um, that I lead to deliver on the priorities adopted by the elected council in those documents. Uh, and we have an organizational framework and that organizational framework um, is designed to effectively deliver on the key priorities that council sets. It's made up of four directorates and I've asked each of the directors to outline their role and key priorities uh, for you now. So first of all, I'm gonna hand over to Ali Dench, Executive Director of Community and Corporate um, to kick us off. Ali, over to you. Cool, thanks, Ben. Uh, this is a great opportunity to have a chat to uh, those that are running and it's just wonderful to see the number of people here this evening to find out more information um, about uh, how, how we can work together to do that. So yeah, my name's Ali Dench and I'm Executive Director for Community and Corporate. Uh, and this particular area uh, looks after lots of, of the back office stuff, I suppose you could say, for council around information technology, our data and information management, uh, also to our customer service and experience function. Uh, we have a graphic, uh, geographic information system, which is all the mapping. Uh, and looking at uh, how, how all, all our areas are mapped across the Shire. And we also, um, in, in this directed look after future innovation and, and a lot of the smart uh, cities initiatives, smart Shire initiatives in the area. Uh, as Ben said, uh, our role, we have a big role to play in building communities. And part of that is around community development. So we work very closely with a lot of the local organisations and groups in the area, such as Men's Sheds and run the Seniors uh, Cafe Connect and Youth Advisory Committee. We, we also, uh, the library, uh, which uh, continues to provide a really wide range and variety of support services to the community. Um, and part of that library service is also our mobile service. So as we reach out across to all different parts of the Shire. We provide children's services in the form of family daycare across the Shire and year round care services. And we're also preparing uh, in the future, looking at a, a new preschool service to a uh, community based style preschool service. We also uh, uh, run events uh, coordination, um, big festival illuminate that we run every year. And also to, we're looking at running in partnership the uh, filmy festival of steam in, uh, in the future and we run a whole heap of other local community events we're looking at a summer festival event we've been uh, running a whole heap of um, community recovery and resilience events after the the um, disasters that we've uh, the bushfire disaster that we had to uh, develop community connectedness uh, 
My area also looks after communications and engagement and advocacy work, so which is a very important uh, part of the council's uh, function is to advocate on behalf of the community to state and federal governments around lots of important issues such as health and wellbeing, public schools, um, and has been highlighted around business investment and jobs, health services, and also improved telecommunications in the area. So as, as the Shire is growing, our challenge will be to maximise opportunities um, and make sure that we've got connected communities. We have a number of key focus areas to enhance service delivery and organisational performance that we are looking at. Uh, and one of those areas is around our recovery and resilience projects. After the recent natural disasters that have occurred, it meant that our focus has really been on how we assist our community in recovery and resilience journey. For this reason, we, we're looking at how we have implemented things. We're doing a, a continuous uh, improvement review on our actions. Um, and also to, we're like making sure that we're implementing best practice approaches to emergency management and disaster recovery. Uh, we actually have just adopted the Activate Wall and Dilly 2021 Long-Term Resilience and Recovery Plan, which will guide uh, an action-focused approach to programs and activities across the Shire. And a lot of these programs and initiatives have been identified through community forums and residents' feedback, which is, again, is a big role for Council to ensure that residents' voices are heard uh, and incorporated into the development of these pla uh, plans such as this. Uh, we support and promote small business and tourism activities across the Shire. Um, we implemented, a, I'm sure you would have heard about the Love to Dilly campaign, encouraging people to shop local. We're uh, about to establish a smart working hub at the old post office and launch a new visitor guide, business directory. And also we implement a lot of online supports and information services, such as our community newsletter, our business newsletters. And, and Facebook page. We're focusing on technology into the, um, our key priorities. We're focusing on technology improvements uh, to improve customer experience and our community engagement and communication processes. As the community grows, it's going to be really, really important for council to maintain and encourage more engagement and participation. Um, and recently we have taken a big leap forward, I believe, in online customer service with the introduction of our new customer service portal and other online service opportunities such as our payments online and DA applications and lodgements online. We have online engagement tools and a Facebook page and, and other channels that we use to ensure communities are engaged, cohesive and also included uh, in, in um, giving feedback and information to, to council, particularly in decision-making processes. We are improving our customer experience um, through the development of uh, customer experience plans across all our areas of council. And also we're looking at how we can enhance the customer service portal that we have in place and also implementing a range of proposed initiatives to improve our technology, um, which, which supports all different areas of council and making sure that our systems are integrated. Um, and we're looking at how we can implement community, uh, continuous improvements in this area. It's a journey as we grow as, a, as an organisation, um, one that we really welcome the input um, from councillors and community in, in, in assisting us in that journey. Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much, Ali. Um, that gives you a, a very quick um, whistle-stop tour there, councillors of the Community and Corporate Directorate. Um, and I suppose you can see very clearly um, how many things it is that council looks after. Um, this is just one of our directorates. And as you can see, there's a bunch of um, roles there that we, we play in the community. Um, and, and most of you know, uh, Ali's focus is internal, but also very much community-based. Um, so I was remiss at the start, actually, that um, I was going to, I'm going to stop after um, the presentations from each of the directors. Um, so if there's any questions that you have um, on those specific um, elements of what we're doing about the, the overall plan for um, delivering a high performance organization or about the specific roles um, that we're playing in each of the directorates, then um, I'll actually ask you to bring them in um, after, after the fourth directorate, which is Matt Toro. So um, right now I'm gonna hand over to Tony Avery to look after planning. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, everyone. And it's a really great opportunity to talk to you about we, what we do in the planning directorate. 
um, picking up on a couple of the themes that both Ben and Ali touched on, it's all about growth. We have our um, major function in planning for growth to ensure that that growth is sustainable and well serviced with infrastructure and to look after our community and our environment. So they're the main driving themes for what we do. Our, our directorate has three branches. Strategic planning is called sustainable growth, development services, and our health and regulatory services area, which looks after a range of functions, including compliance, but also things like environmental health, animal management functions, our animal shelter, and of course, our um, routine um, registrations of such things as our um, on-site sewerage systems and the like. Much of what the health and regulatory services area does is statutory. In other words, it's set by legislation and it's not something that we have much discretion about. It's something that the state has, a, um, has required us to do. In terms of strategic planning, our function is largely about planning for growth. And we have a lot of that coming to us now and into the future. As noted there, our current population is expected to double by 2036. And we need to make sure that we're ready for that growth. And we have a sound blueprint for growth. Our growth is our vision for growth is set by our local strategic planning statement, which is called Wallandilly 2040. And there's a, an image of the front cover of that publication. It was um, finalized in March last year, a massive piece of work to set the vision for Wallandilly Shire for the next 20 years. It sits alongside our community strategic plan to provide clear direction and inform council on decision making going forward to look after our population now and as I said into the next 20 years. The vision for Wallandilly in the local strategic planning statement is an enviable, enviable lifestyle of historic villages, modern living, rural lands and bush. I think what's really important about that document is that it actually values what we have now and what makes Wallandilly unique while planning to accommodate the growth that is coming. It provides, I suppose, ground rules for what we want to see in that growth and how we want to see the um, new communities develop. Our main growth area is Wilton, and I'll go on to uh, talk about that now. Mel, could you please move to the next slide? Thank you. So, we're, we're planning for our growing population at Wilton. So the Wilton growth area is a, 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 it's an area that's been gazetted by the state government as a growth area. The population for Wilton is estimated to grow to about 50,000 people. So when we talk about our population doubling by 2036, most of that growth will be in the Wilton area. It's an exciting time for Wilton. We have a town centre that is um, about to be rezoned. The Minister for Planning has announced that it's a priority of his that it's rezoned in spring, which could be any time between September and November. Uh, what's really important to um, Council in terms of that rezoning is that the infrastructure to support it is guaranteed by the developer, by the state and we're in the process of continuing our advocacy and negotiation around that to make sure that new town is going to be um, a real opportunity for employment. It's going to be an opportunity for community activities and a whole range of recreational and community facilities, as well as a great place to live. Another exciting point about Wilton is that Council had a strong vision that Wilton would be a unique place, a sustainable place, and set a model as an exemplar of new planning. We've been working with the state government to ensure that those principles are enshrined and that Wilton will have a, an extensive tree canopy and it will have um, areas for community to recreate and enjoy 
blending in with the natural environment. I'll just move on to a couple of those other points there. The um, first point on there is about activating the rural and visitor economy. So it was noted earlier about the importance of creating jobs and supporting employment and business within the Shire. And these changes are designed to facilitate that. So LEP stands for Local Environment Plan and it sets our planning rules, our framework for what happens in development. This is another statutory document and it's um, a requirement that development complies with the provisions of the Local Environment Plan. If we want to change the rules around development, we have to change the LEP. And we're in the process of doing that at this very moment to achieve those outcomes that are noted there. Our first LEP change is really around celebrations and community events. It's about facilitating the opportunity for community events across a wide range of different land types in the Shire. And it's also about um, supporting activities in the rural areas that are also celebrations, things like weddings and also tourist accommodation. We're looking at um, bringing in the opportunity for tourist parks. So that's, that's actually in the pipeline at the moment. It may well be that that uh, change goes to the department uh, sometime just after the election, as it's already um, been exhibited. The second part of that change is about the visitor economy. And that's um, about changing those planning rules to enable a whole range of other uses to occur within our rural zones. Again, to help support the rural economy and to support our rural landowners. And to bring people into the Shire to enjoy what we enjoy about it and to grow jobs. Second, the third point down there is revitalising Picton. We have uh, exciting news to announce. Our Picton Place Plan, which will set the direction for the future of the Picton Town Centre, was endorsed by Council last night. What that is, um, what that does is change the planning rules, or proposes to change the planning rules for the Picton Town Centre, and it will enable a lot of activation and again, create jobs. Central to that, of course, is our Picton precinct, but I'll leave that for uh, Michael Malone to talk about in um, his um, discussion in a few minutes. Economic recovery and jobs are a key platform for council. And to that end, one of our, our priorities this year is to progress some more work in that local environment plan to rezone employment lands so that more jobs can be established particularly in our growth area around Mal Malden and around Wilton, we anticipate creating 15,000 jobs for 15,000 dwellings. We're also focused on improving our development assessment processes. And a lot of work has been put into this into recent times. In the first um, instance, we've been working on our planning portal with the state government to enable faster lodgement, more streamlined assessment services. We also have a DA tracker on our website, which enables you to follow any development application that's lodged in the Shire. We're excited about two new positions that were approved in the recent budget. The first one is a, an executive planner, and that role is to act as a facilitator, a concierge, um, a, a provide red carpet treatment, if you like, for development and investment in the Shire. The second one is a duty planner. That's a position that will work with mums and dads. It will help guide people through the planning process and support customer service in the work that um, Ali talked about earlier. We're excited about those positions. And in fact, we've uh, made an offer on the duty planner and it's been accepted. So we hope to have that person starting within a matter of weeks. In talking about Wilton, we have to acknowledge that a big part of our role is not only doing the planning, but also advocating to the state government not only the Department of Planning, but all of the state agencies 
for the provision, the timely provision of the essential infrastructure to support that growth. That's been a big focus of the council over the last term, and it's certainly something that council officers have focused on in our engagement with the Department of Planning and other agencies, and of course, with the development industry. Wilton is, a, is an area that requires a lot of infrastructure. We have many priorities. Transport is a big one, education facilities, community facilities, and public transport. And we'll continue to um, advocate for that infrastructure as the town grows. And finally, I mentioned about the health and regulatory services environment. That's essential uh, department. That's essentially what we're doing there. It's about protecting the environment and the community. The rules are in place to ensure that we are operating safely, that businesses are operating safely, and that our community is uh, protected and preserved. That's um, all I'll cover for now, but I'm happy to answer questions later on. Um, thanks, Ben. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, much appreciated. There's definitely a lot happening in the planning world. So next, to move over to Michael Malone, the Director of Infrastructure and Environment. Michael. Thank you, Ben, and good evening, everybody. Uh, yes, my name is Michael Malone. I'm the Director of Infrastructure and Environment, and I'm privileged to work with about 120 members of uh, Council's organisation to look after uh, nearly all of the uh, assets for the Shire, for the community of the Shire, which is just over $900 million worth. And we do this uh, across five main areas. Uh, the first one being infrastructure operations, which predominantly looks after the construction and maintenance of um, our, our assets. That's uh, patching the roads, resealing them, reconstructing them, the footpaths, uh, the drains, the pits, et cetera. Um, and, and they're the, the main group that look after that 870 odd kilometres of roads that service the Shire. Uh, next, we have the parks and recreation section. Uh, they look after all those sporting fields, the play equipment, the two aquatic areas they have, the pools, um, uh, the public toilets and whatnot. And they plan for the future as our, as our community uh, grows and changes in its expectations of how it would like to um, recreate and live in our environment. Uh, the waste and environmental services team um, sounds pretty obvious. They look after all the waste issues for the, uh, the Shire. So they manage our domestic waste collection and processing. They also run a landfill down at the Bargo Waste Management Centre, uh, where they're currently uh, planning the introduction of a community recycling centre. Uh, that team uh, also does the environmental sustainability and biodiversity planning and strategies for the Shire, looking after those big picture items such as the integrated water strategy and the Shire-wide koala plan of management. Uh, the next section is our property and projects area. Um, they manage our property portfolio, all those bits of land that we uh, hold across the Shire, um, and those bits of land that we have to acquire sometimes to widen roads or, or um, get uh, areas to work, such as allowing the expansion of our recycling facility down at Bargo. They also manage our larger, more complicated projects, um, such as the image that's showing on the screen there, the, uh, the construction of the roundabout at the intersection of Remembrance Drive and Finns Road up at Cordor, uh, the Tarmor Sporting Complex, the uh, the that's the netball courts that were finished earlier this year and the athletics track um, and the Wallandilly Community Cultural and Civic Precinct and the pathway work that's currently underway at the old Menangle school site, Menangle. Um, the next, but by no means uh, least section is the assets, transport and engineering area. They have the almighty task of trying to understand and manage those 900 odd million dollars worth of assets and have a plan to renew those assets um, and replace them or uh, make them bigger to service the existing community and the growing community. Uh, that's the team that put together that five-year roadworks program that's currently showing on our website. Um, but in addition to that, they also do a lot of background work, work in the traffic and transport area, working out, for example, why do we need to fix that uh, intersection of Finns Road and Remembrance Driveway, and why is that roundabout the best solution uh, for the traffic that we'll be dealing with over the next decade or so. Uh, that team also um, 
looks after the subdivision process. So we uh, do the subdivision inspect inspections and um, receipt those new uh, road and footpath assets that the, uh, the developers uh, want to cede to council. Uh, that team's responsible for making sure that we're receiving assets that are fit for purpose for the long term, not just for the term of that development. Uh, next slide, please. For the, uh, the next financial year, 21-22, some of the key things that uh, the infrastructure and environment section will be looking after, we will be delivering a capital works program that will exceed $33.7 million. Uh, in which we will be doing an $18 million program of works to continue fixing the roads across the Shire. With that asset management focus, we'll be maintaining our financial sustainability for asset management, making sure that those assets are looked after the, to the extent that we can with the resources that are available to us. We'll be continuing to deliver the Wallandilly Community Cultural and Civic Precinct with the first things off the, the rack being the new performing arts centre at the corner of Menangle Street and Colden Street, the new childcare building behind the Shire Hall and finishing the refurbishment of the Shire Hall. So that if you are the successful uh, new council, we will have a suitable place for you to hold those monthly council meetings. So you, uh, instead of the building that we're currently residing in, uh, which is well and truly showing its age. We'll also be continuing to um, procure the next waste collection and management contracts because our current contracts fall due in 2024. And as you would expect, that's a rather large and challenging procurement process to go to go through. Um, this year with the benefit of some grants that um, uh, we've just applied for that we are very confident we will be receiving, we'll be finishing uh, the next large stage of the Tarmor Sporting Complex with the construction of the $4.6 million multi-purpose amenities building to uh, work right next to the new, the 12 new netball courts and the new athletics uh, track. Thank you. Great stuff, thanks very much, Michael. Definitely uh, a lot on in your space as well. Um, next I'll hand over please to Matthew Toro, Assistant Director, People, Legal and Governance. Matthew. Uh, thank you, Ben, and good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for all the opportunity to come and uh, meet you all this evening. And I'm really here tonight to just give you a very, very brief introduction to what the Office of the CEO, being the people, legal and governance function of council does. So firstly, um, the corporate governance function and um, some of the uh, fantastic team members are here tonight hosting. Um, and what really the corporate governance functions about is about looking after our councillors first and foremost, and to enable them to um, carry out their civic functions and to do a number of other tasks um, associated with that, such as running our monthly council meetings, our community forums, our briefings, and other formal forums of council. Um, we're also the team responsible for publishing the monthly business paper that's put out to the community and enables our councillors to make um, decisions um, on behalf of our community. Uh, we look after the overall framework of the council as well when it comes to what our council policies are, our delegations, um, the structures and frameworks around councillors and their interactions with various other policies, procedures. Um, we also look after our insurance and risk management portfolio as part of that team. Um, another area of my responsibility is our people and culture team. And what this is, is really our human resources and our people services function at council. So this includes all our staff learning and development, our payroll services, work health and safety, and our staff engagement, which is very important. Um, as Ben said in the introduction, we have 300 staff um, and that's growing. Um, it's across a, what is a very diverse multidisciplinary workforce. Um, we have um, field staff, we have professional staff and a variety of other different staff in multiple positions across the council. Um, so it's a, it's a really, I guess, a, a fantastic um, staff cohort that we have. And, um, you know, it's very much through our staff that we achieve great things for the community. Um, the next part of my portfolio is the legal function and it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. It provides, a, I guess, a range of legal services to our councillors and to our staff. Um, 
corporate strategy and the integrated planning and reporting framework. So this is um, a new responsibility in my portfolio. And what this is, is about is, I guess, really setting out our corporate plans for our organisation and the council. So when, the, when we uh, have the new councillors come on board after the September election, one of the first things that our councillors will be doing is developing um, our new CSP and our delivery program. And our delivery program, as, as Ben said in the introduction, is really about our aspirations and our strategies and our outcomes that the new council want to achieve over the next three years. So it's our key document that is providing, I guess, guidance to our staff and our organisation of all the things that um, the new council wants to achieve. So it's a, it's a very critical document and um, my team will be working directly with the new council to obviously formulate what their plans are for the next three year term. Um, over to the next slide, please, Mel. So some of the key strategic priorities um, for the years ahead for the uh, people, legal and governance function, um, continue to have a highly engaged and supported workforce. Um, we have recently did a staff pulse survey and I'm happy to report that um, our council actually scored in the top 10% of councils for our overall staff engagement. And um, I, I, I put that down to all the, the great work that all of our executive leadership team has been doing and our management team has been doing working with our staff um, to get those results. Um, as I said before, getting um, having, I guess, a highly engaged and motivated workforce leads only to good outcomes for the community. Um, the next key priority area for us is developing a business enhancement plan. So what this is about is really about, I guess, looking at all the growth that is coming, get, I guess, setting out a clear plan for the future about how we'll grow our organisation, how we'll continue to provide high performing services to our customers and the community, and what changes and adaptions that we need to make along the way. And part of that comes um, as to the next priority, which is about investment in our resources. So this is about as part of the planning process for responding to our growth. It's about giving our staff the, all the relevant tools, the systems, the processes and the practices to be able to continue to deliver for our community. And through obviously that growth and that pressure on our services, we'll need to continue to invest in our staff and our resources to, to continue to deliver for the community. Um, last but not least is uh, implementing a um, variety of other local government reforms. Um, so the state government and the Office of Local Government have introduced a number of reforms to the local government sector over the last few years. And what this is about is about um, really enhancing the risk culture and also the, the governance practices of councils across New South Wales. So um, many councils are going down the path of this, um, introducing these new reforms. Um, we're well in front of the curve of those reforms um, and we've implemented a number of key things in our organisation to enable us to have good risk management practices. Um, our Audit Risk and Improvement Committee, which is an independent committee that has oversight of our functions. That's one example of something that we've already introduced, which um, some other councils don't actually have. And it provides our elected body with the assurance over our processes, um, our improvement opportunities, and as well as our finances as well. So that's a brief introduction into the people, legal and governance function. Thank you, Ben. Thanks very much, Matt. Um, uh, would you mind just turning the presentation off, please, uh, Mel? And uh, what we might do now for everyone um, who's uh, part of part of this meeting, um, it is a bit clunky, I know, I'd much prefer to be meeting us in person, but um, COVID is what it is, so we need to follow the rules. So um, now I'd like to just pause here for a second and open up for any questions. Um, if you do have a question um, and you're part of the panel, um, you can raise your hand, um, not physically raise your hand because I can't actually see everyone on the screen. Um, you'll need to press the raise hand button um, and then our wonderful governance staff will identify you and, and, um, and bring you across to ask your question. Um, so while I do that, um, Lexi, is there anyone who has their hand up that wants to ask a question? No one at this stage with their hand up, but there is one written question. 
Okay, would you like to read that out for me, please? Yep. So the question uh, is from an anonymous person. The question is, how are we planning on getting enough water? The plan is already a billion dollars short, as stated in last night's meeting. How are you planning on paying for everything when we don't have nearly enough money, water or data? Okay, good question. Um, that's a great, great for us um, for asking that one. Uh, Tony, can you answer that one, please, as the director of planning? Yeah, th thanks, Ben, and yeah, thanks for the question. It's certainly a topical issue in the Shire, and and it was top of mind, particularly during the drought, the drought period, um, a couple of years ago. So, as I mentioned earlier, in planning for Wilton. A big part of the planning for Wilton is planning for the infrastructure and advocating for the infrastructure. The state agencies are delivering the infrastructure and it's all about staging and sequencing of that infrastructure delivery. Water is a key consideration and a key focus of this community and this council. And it's been something that we have um, uh, addressed with Sydney Water um, many times throughout this planning period for Wilton. Sydney Water is the agency responsible for the provision of water and sewage services to our communities. It's not a council function, it's a Sydney Water function, so it's a state government function. We recognise the concerns that community have, and we've had a water symposium, symposium very recently here in Wallandilly. If you want to have a look at the detailed information that was provided by Sydney Water at that water symposium and the answers to a number of questions which are similar to this question, please have a look at Council's website and just uh, go into the search bar under water symposium and you'll be able to have a look at the answers they've provided and in fact the presentation they delivered at the time. Sydney Water has a plan to service Wilton for both water and sewage. But the plan is in progress. They don't have everything on the ground at this time in terms of those plans, but they're in the process of, of finalising their service plans for growth. Sydney Water has been working on the Greater MacArthur Regional Growth Plan so that will cover the Wilton growth area and the rest of the growth area there into Appen and Gilead. And they're also at the moment working on the Greater Sydney Water Strategy, which when it's approved by the state government will replace the Metropolitan Water Plan. Those documents set the strategic framework and direction to ensure that the water needs of growing Sydney, not only in Wilton and Greater MacArthur, but all of Sydney are met Thanks, Ben. Thanks very much, Tony. Uh, is there any other questions from anyone in the group? There's no hands raised at the moment, Ben, and no other written questions. Okay, no worries. Um, so we might move on then, please. Um, the next session we're just going to go through, which is a, a little bit of the headlines in terms of the role of a council law. Um, and starting, first of all, I suppose, at the high level, which is the, the government framework. Uh, unfortunately, um, council uh, and the elected council is not in charge of everything. Um, the federal government has its role in terms of Medicare, defence, immigration, foreign policy. Um, the state is responsible for roads, housing, uh, prisons, public transport, police, ambulance services. Um, and the role of local councils is often described as roads, rates and rubbish. Uh, but really predominantly, as you've seen, it's a broad range of services that we provide for the community. Um, a key role as well of local government is really to work in partnership with the state and federal governments um, to deliver those big ticket infrastructure priorities and also the high quality services and community services that, um, that are delivered for the people of Wallandelli. So um, it's important just to have that framework in mind when you're thinking about the role of council uh, and the role of a council law. Uh, move on to the next slide, please. So the role of a council law. Uh, we've pulled the wording directly out of the Local Government Act um, as the single source of truth. Um, and I won't go through all of these, but um, I suppose what I want to highlight for you particularly um, is that the Act is very clear in the role of a council law is to be an active and contributing member of the governing body. 
um, you are one of you will be one of eight um, council laws um, around the table, uh, plus the elected mayor. Um, who will govern um, the, the, the function of Wallandilly Shire Council. And the, the role there really is to make considered and well-informed decisions. And, and our job as the organisation is to provide you with that advice, um, with that evidence, um, so that you can, can make those well-informed decisions on behalf um, of the community as a whole. Um, you're also responsible for participating in the, in the integrated planning and reporting framework, which uh, Matt talked about. So the community strategic plan, the delivery plan, the operational plan, uh, and also performing a key role um, to facilitate communication between the local community and the council as a group. As accountable, uh, as, as a council law, sorry, um, you're accountable to the local community uh, for the performance of the council. And ultimately, the, um, the performance measure um, is the uh, elections which happen normally every four years. Uh, next slide, please. The role of the mayor uh, is the same as the council law, um, but also under the Local Government Act, um, the mayor is, is classed as the leader of the council and also a leader in the community. Um, they're the principal member and spokesperson of the council. Uh, they carry out civic and ceremonial functions such as, Australia, um, so, such as citizenship ceremonies. Um, they preside at meetings of the council as, as the chair. They also, under the act, are enabled to exercise urgent policy-making functions between council meetings. Uh, other functions as determined by council and also work closely with the general manager or in this case for Wallandilly, the CEO, um, to, on, to deliver the strategic direction of the council uh, and, and to guide uh, the implementation of council's policies, plans and strategies. Uh, there's a whole lot more that's contained in section 226 of the Local Government Act, uh, but we just went through some of the highlights here. Uh, next slide, please. And then the role of the governing body. So as a council law, particularly, um, as I said, you're one of um, nine uh, members of the governing body um, and your role collectively is to direct and control the affairs of council in, accord with, in accordance with the Local Government Act and also other relevant acts um, to provide effective civic leadership to the local community. And I'm just going to stop on that one for a second because um, those words civic leadership, I think, are a really key, um, a key term um, for a council law. Uh, and I think one of the one of the key challenges as well for um, for someone running for council is is the transition from being uh, a community campaigner, which is the role you need to play um, in the lead up to the elections, obviously, to secure the votes you need to become a councillor, um, to transition through to being a civic leader. Uh, and the role of civic leader really is to provide um, a leadership to the community, but also to represent the collective views of the whole of the Bolandelli Shire. Um, your role as uh, a member of the governing body is to focus on the financial sustainability of council, um, the development of, community, of uh, the community strategic plan, delivery program and other strategies, plans, programs, strategies and policies. Uh, and there's a, there's a big list there. And the reason why is because it, what it's doing is highlighting the key role of the council around strategic uh, and policy making. So your role as an elected body is to really set those strategies, to set those policies. Uh, and then my job is to deliver or implement the, uh, the, the decisions of council um, as quickly as I possibly can, as efficiently as I possibly can. Um, as the governing body, the council also determines the operational plan, which is the annual budget of council and, and the things that we do uh, in, in the year, in the financial year, as well as the revenue and rating policy, and to um, continually review the performance of council and also its delivery of services. Move over to the next slide, please. The, um, the role of the governing body continues, so I'm still going because there is a lot of points in the Local Government Act, um, is also to, to, to determine the process for appointment of the general manager, or as I said before, in the case of Warren Daly, the CEO, uh, and monitor the performance, um, to determine the senior staff positions within the organisation structure. So uh, for Warren Daly, it's the there's three director positions plus myself who are senior staff, staff positions. Uh, and then to consult regularly with community organisations and other key stakeholders about council's decisions and activities, uh, and to consult with the general manager, um, the CEO, in directing and controlling the affairs of council. Uh, and the way that the, the local government is established really is that the, the role of the governing body is a collective role in overseeing and guiding the direction of council. Uh, move over to the next slide for me, please. 
And lastly, the role of the Chief Executive Officer and staff. Um, so my primary role is to ensure the efficient and effective operation of the organisation and also the implementation of the decisions of council. So um, myself, um, the executive team, and also the, the managers throughout the organisation particularly uh, provide a lot of advice to councillors. We provide recommendations, we provide uh, information notes, we provide briefing sessions, and they're all designed to assist council um, with the development and decision making um, of its strategic plans and policy. And then once a decision is made by the elected council, our job is to implement those decisions without undue delay. Uh, my role is to uh, look after the day-to-day -day operations of council, um, the appointment, directing and dismissing of staff, uh, and also exercising functions which are delegated by the council. So the council has the ability to delegate to me um, some of its powers um, to improve the efficiency of the organisation, such as um, the, um, the approval of tenders, uh, which are largely operational matters, um, which can save us a lot of time and actually speed up the ability of council to deliver its services um, uh, to the community. In terms of staff, um, obviously their role is the day-to-day -day operations of the council um, to implement council policies and other decisions um, as directed by myself. And there's a lot more obviously to the role of the staff, but as, as contained in the Local Government Act, um, that's how it's defined. Uh, would you mind moving on to the next slide for me, please? Okay, so we're gonna jump here into um, a bit of a toolkit for council laws um, and also some of the, the, the key um, capabilities. But before we do that, I might just, um, if you don't mind, please Bell turning the um, presentation off again. I might just pause for a second um, to see if there are any questions from anyone um, in the group um, regarding any of the stuff that I've just um, whisked through relatively quickly. Uh, there, there's no written questions, Ben, and no one seems to have their hand raised. Okay, I might just pause for a second. If anyone wants to ask any questions about the role of council um, or the role of the mayor or the role of um, uh, the chief executive officer and, and staff, then uh, please put up your hand now. Um, we're, we also can come back later on, um, but I just want to pause for right this second in case you have any burning questions you want to raise. Okay, good. Well, let's move back on then, if you don't mind putting the presentation back on. Okay, so toolkit for councillors, nice, nice definition. Um, so for me, the, the most successful councillors that I've seen and, and the ones that really thrive in the role uh, are those that have a passion for social justice and particularly your community. I mean, the council law is really um, you are putting yourself um, into, into a leadership role on behalf of the community and, and those that have really thrived and succeeded have been the ones that are passionate about the community and, and delivering really positive outcomes for the community that they serve. Uh, good communication and interpersonal skills, um, strategic thinking and the ability to solve problems. Uh, we spend quite a bit of time or the council spends quite a bit of time together, uh, particularly at council meetings, working through problems uh, and solving issues to come up with the best possible solution. Um, good organisation and time management. It is a big commitment. I've got to say that it is a big commitment um, as as um, uh, as a council law. Um, it's a challenge, and you need to be good at organising your time uh, and also um, your other skills. There are, you know, the council meetings have big papers. They're um, they're, they're large agendas, uh, and your ability your ability to manage your often work life as well as uh, managing um, the council is is a challenge. Uh, an understanding of strategic planning, financial management and governance requirements for local government and also strong leadership qualities. Now, we put this together, I suppose, as a, a, a toolkit of, of potential capabilities that council, council laws might have. Uh, but I wanted to mention right here before you get um, a bit worried about some of these things to say that we're here to help you. So if you are elected as a council law, we have a significant induction program, a whole lot of training planned, a whole lot of support planned for the council laws um, to uh, provide you that training, provide you that support and advice to enable you to be really effective in your role. Uh, move on to the next slide, please, for me. So the, the um, Local Government New South Wales uh, is the peak body for councils in New South Wales. Uh, its president is Linda Scott, who's a councillor from the City of Sydney. Uh, and Local Government New South Wales has a board of, of council laws, which oversets, oversees its policy and strategy. Uh, and it actually sets out a capability framework. Uh, and that local government capability framework sets out what the um, what LGNSW believes is the essential knowledge, skills and capabilities to work effectively 
as a council or in the mayor. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I just did want to highlight this to you because I think that's a really good list of the sorts of capabilities that council laws can have. Now, you, again, you're not expected to have all of these from day one, uh, but what we'll do is we'll actually support those council laws that are elected to develop their own training plan uh, and capability improvement plan um, so that we can support you to be as effective as you possibly can be in the role. Next slide, please. So some of the examples um, you can see here on the screen um, where what they've done is they've actually pulled apart all the potential capabilities um, for a council or uh, and the mayor and have identified the real key ones that they believe or the core capabilities that they believe a council or um, needs or a successful council or would exhibit uh, as well as a successful mayor. Next slide, please. Okay, the time commitment. I think right here, I'm gonna hand over to Mr. Toro. So Matthew Toro, would you mind taking over from here? Yep. Thank you, Ben. Um, so this next slide is, I guess, really from, I guess, my perspective as a, a governance officer um, and having worked in a number of councils prior to being at Woolandilly. Um, so it's just my perspective of, of what I've seen and getting to know many councillors over the years about what the what's actually involved, you know, what type of time are we actually talking about here? Um, so the best way of answering it um, is this. So. Um, for me, um, the core things that councillors do in a month. So at Woolandilly, we have two briefings, um, one community forum and one formal council meeting per month. Um, and as Ben said before, with those type of uh, forums that I've just mentioned, there's a lot of reading involved with that. And if anyone's seen some of our um, business papers, we know that they can sometimes be very, very chunky and there's lots of material and information to digest. Um, in terms of um, other functions that you might be doing within the month, um, there are many hours, I guess, really at your discretion about how much more time you want to put in. And there could be a range of informal duties, such as meeting with your constituents, um, attending community functions, um, residents contacting you via telephone, letter, email. Um, and sometimes that might not necessarily be during a reasonable hour. Some of our councillors get phone calls and emails at all sorts of crazy hours of the day. Um, you may also be um, asked, and obviously not during the COVID period, but you may also be visiting residents in their homes or public spaces to be having, I guess, meetings with them about particular concerns they have in the community. Um, if you do decide to take on, I guess, a more of an advanced role as an elected councillor, there are opportunities there to chair um, special interest reference groups. Um, and obviously, if you decide to do that, there's the, the time commitment is um, obviously a, a bit more. Um, we have a variety of different functions and events on at council throughout the year. And these events are generally voluntary for councillors. Um, if they choose to attend them, um, it's completely up to their discretion, but councillors are all invited to attend um, various events and other forums that we have throughout the year. Um, look, if you ask me the question about how, how much time per week would you spend on being a, a councillor, um, I would say it's probably around between, say, 10 to 20 hours a week, depending on obviously the commitment that you would like to apply to the role. Um, and I would say it's, it's a lot more time if you are the popular elected mayor. Um, the mayor has, um, as Ben said in, the, in his previous slide there, there's a number of other additional responsibilities for the mayor. Um, a councillor, um, being elected as a councillor is a commitment. Um, in this term, it's a three year commitment due to COVID. Um, the, the term slightly shortened. Um, but it is, I guess, a significant commitment to be putting your hand up and to also be elected as a councillor. Um, the good news is, is that many of our councillors um, have been able to balance the hectic life of being a councillor with their full-time jobs and also the family and caring responsibilities. Um, so the good news is, is that it is certainly doable. Um, and whilst it is challenging, it is very, very rewarding to see the, the great outcomes that you can deliver to our community through your leadership. Um, ben mentioned earlier on before about, this, about the support that we provide. And um, not only do we have a dedicated corporate governance team, 
that um, provide a lot of support to our counsellors, but we also have a number of other frameworks in place to provide you with all the tools and the abilities to, to juggle all the, the hecticness of life um, and all the challenges that the role of the counsellor does bring. Um, ben mentioned about prioritising your time. That's obviously a, a key skill and a key little trick for the role about trying to, to balance everything. Um, but I mean, ultimately, I feel the, the rewards of helping people and making a difference in the community, I feel is, is very much well worth the, the commitment and the time commitment that you are going to give over the next three years. Um, if we can just go to the next slide, please. So this next slide is about the, the counsellor support that's available. Um, so um, in terms of what a counsellor receives, um, once they're elected, they receive a, a monthly electoral allowance, and that's to obviously cover the, um, the cost of being a, a counsellor. Um, I know you guys are all doing it for the love, but um, being realistic as well in this day to day, there's, there's, there's obviously um, lots of things that, um, that need to be spent and um, your time and commitment is, is valued. And I guess that's why that allowance is there. Um, there's a dedicated um, training and conference budget for counsellors as well. And that's to help you with your ongoing learning and development as a counsellor. Um, we provide the tools of the trade as well to counsellors. We provide phone, um, computers, laptops, um, and internet access. There's reasonable reimbursement for accommodation, meals and expenses. That's all of your out-of-pocket expenses as well. And we have a policy around that. Um, carer responsibilities. Um, there is a carer's expense as well whilst performing uh, the council duties. Uh, the state government recently has introduced as well from July 2022 superannuation for councillors, which is a new thing for um, New South Wales councillors. Um, there's a few other jurisdictions around Australia have got that for councillors, but that's, that's a fairly um, new thing for us. So that will come into effect from July next year. Um, as part of the corporate governance team, we also have a, an executive assistant to mayor and councillors, uh, Christy, who is actually part of the audience tonight. Um, and Christy is a, a fairly new role um, that we've appointed at council and, and she provides that dedicated administrative and executive support to our councillors and the mayor. Uh, next slide, please. So professional uh, development and our induction program. Um, so it's not, I guess, the case when you're elected that we simply say to you, okay, um, you're thrown in the deep end, um, go for it. Um, it's far from that. We have a, a, an intensive induction program, which goes over the space of uh, three weeks at the beginning of when the new council starts. And that induction program is, I guess, a variety of different things. It's, if I can theme it, it, it really comes down to, I guess, the, the nuts and bolts of being a council. It looks at things such as how you can make the best decisions as being a councillor. It gives you information about all the other areas of council. Um, we've only touched on, I guess, a very, very small high level um, information from each of our directors here tonight, but we give you all the information and, uh, and hopefully teach you the ropes about the different areas of council and what we do. Um, we have the ability to set up a ongoing um, professional development plan for counsellors. And as I said before, we have a dedicated training budget where if you identify that there are you know, certain gaps that you have, or if there's certain things that you would like to learn more about, we can um, provide a training program for you. And also through the assistance of our, our um, peak body, Local Government New South Wales, there's a variety of other counsellor training and networking opportunities there for you as well. Um, our counsellor induction program isn't simply a three week and that's it. It's really, I guess, a rolling program for the three years. So we take um, the opportunity at some of our um, briefings throughout the term to really give our guests, our counsellors, um, all the information that they need and also to get them fully informed and across all the different areas to enable them to make the best possible decisions at the council meetings itself. Um, the Office of Local Government is very much focusing on council laws um, and their professional development. So there's actually quite um, a robust framework now around council law learning and development. It's an ex expectation of the role of a councillor that it's about continuing learning. 
Um, so it features very heavily as part of our ongoing program for our new councillors. Um, as the slide said, you're not expected to know everything on day one and we're here to help you and we're here to set you up for the best possible um, opportunities for success to deliver for our community. Uh, next slide, please. So what this is about is really, I guess I've mentioned a lot tonight about frameworks and legal responsibilities. This is just a slide just to let um, councillors know that um, it can be, I guess, a bit of a, a legal minefield when it comes to understanding what your legal responsibilities and ethical responsibilities are as a councillor. Um, there's lots of pieces of legislation and some of them are just cited in there as well as codes of practice. Um, we're here to help you and to help councillors understand what their obligations are and to navigate through that minefield. Um, although there is lots there, um, it's certainly not something that you can't navigate through with our help. Um, and it's really these frameworks are in place to ensure, I guess, the transparency and accountability of um, the local um, arm of council to our community. Um, but don't be overwhelmed by that. We, we are certainly here to assist you navigate through all those pieces of legislation. Next slide, please. Um, this is just some information here from the um, New South Wales Electoral Commission. So the New South Wales Electoral Commission is running the local government election and they're the first point of call for any information about eligibility to nominate. Um, we've got some details at the end of the presentation about how you can contact the Electoral Commission if you have any, I guess, questions about that. Um, but this slide just gives you a bit of, a, I guess, an overview about are you eligible to nominate and put your hand up to be um, considered as a council law. Um, so information's in there, but uh, the Electoral Commission is the first point of call for any queries around that. Next slide, please. Um, here's some important dates. Um, again, this is all on the New South Wales Electoral Commission website, so um, you don't have to write all this down. Um, we'll be sending out a copy of the presentation to you um, after the um, session this evening. So um, it just really is a summary of some of the key um, timelines. So um, the nomination period for people wishing to be considered for uh, election is on the 26th of July. And that then starts what's called the regulated period. And that's really about the um, advertising and the electoral material, which is the start of that period in there. Um, there's a candidate handbook available to anyone considering um, standing for council. And that can, candidate handbook is on the New South Wales Electoral Commission website. And it gives you a lot of information about the, the rules and the do's and the don'ts when it comes to electoral material and advertising in there. So I would encourage you to go and have a look at that. Um, and then the rest of the dot points in there just gives you some key dates and milestones right up to the um, actual um, election date itself. Um, and as we can see there with COVID as well, there's going to obviously be um, a lot more focus on um, the electronic uh, voting, which the Electoral Commission has recently announced. Um, and there will obviously be, hopefully, depending on the COVID situation, um, the, the physical um, voting at the ballot box as well, but it's to be determined by the Electoral Commission there. Um, once the election is uh, held, um, there's could be a bit of a period of time before we know who our elected councillors are, um, and the Electoral Commission make the declaration of the results around the end of September in there. And that's when we reach out to the elected council and we, or the elected councillors at that point, and we bring you on board for the induction. Now, what we do are going to do um, for anyone that wants the information on the what the proposed induction program looks like, um, the governance team can send copies out to um, anyone who wishes to have a look at that. And that gives you a bit of an idea of, I guess, what the induction program looks like for the first three weeks. So it's certainly some interesting reading and it gives you a good perspective of the time commitment that you'll have to put aside if you are elected. Um, to participate in the first part of the induction process. Uh, next slide, some key contacts in there as well, which I've um, already made um, reference to. Next slide, please. And here's just some links there. Um, Electoral Commission is one that I would suggest um, you have take a look at and the candidate handbook in there. 
Um, and there's some other information there as well along with that as well, such as our website and um, Office of Local Government. Thank you, Ben, over to you. Great stuff, thank you, Matt. Um, so um, for everyone who's thankfully joined us today, uh, we've bombarded you with a whole lot of information. Um, we've tried to keep it relatively short. There's obviously a whole lot more detail behind uh, what council does and um, we're very happy to share any of that information you would like. Um, I would encourage you to um, uh, take up the offer if you're interested of coming in and having a chat. Um, in the COVID world we'll need to do that over Zoom or over Teams uh, but I'm very happy to do so. You just need to get in contact with my uh, executive assistant Deb Hunt. Um, her contact details are on the website so if you look on, on council's website um, under the um, election page you'll find the contact details there. So um, here we are at the end. Um, so we're going now into the Q&A session. Um, what I might ask the hostess to do, if you don't mind, is turn the presentation off um, and then also put the um, format. Can you turn the format back to gallery mode, perhaps, if that's possible, um, so we can see everyone who's in the audience. Um, and then if anyone has any questions, um, please put your hand up. Um, the only person in the audience I can see is Michael, uh, but if anyone else has any questions, please put your hand up and um, we'll jump in from there. Otherwise, you're welcome to type in your question as well into the chat box. It's not quite the same, is it? It's catching up in person. Not quite the same. Don't get to have a cup of tea. Don't get to sit down, have a proper conversation. You know, we're talking over a screen. It's not really the same, is it? So apologies, um, it's out of our control, but hopefully we can um, at least um, answer any questions you've got. Um, so would anyone like to ask anything? If you would like to, you can simply take your microphone off mute, um, jump on in and ask away. I can't quite hear you, is it? Yeah, I think Brendan. Brendan, we can't hear you. Can't quite hear you, Brendan. I can see we can see your mouth moving. Try again. It's all right. We've got time. Uh, what about now? Is it working? Yes, we've got you. Yep. Ta da! All right. Go technology. Just Welcome. Great. Congratulations. Great. You win a prize. First question. <laughs> Just wondering, so we're talking about planning here, right, with Wilton. Yep. And so uh, I know this is getting a bit ahead of myself, but so what capacity, when you're talking about state government stuff, does the council have for getting those things implemented, such as police stations and hospitals and things like that? So that's obviously yeah. beyond council's reach, but there's still services that are going to be needed, especially when you're talking 100,000 people in Willandilly. Mm -hmm. And we currently don't have either. So good question. Um, Tony, do you want to jump in and answer that one? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Brendan, for the question. There's a really strong framework around planning for the infrastructure at both state and local level. At the local level, we have a thing called the Development Contributions Plan. And what that does is identify all the infrastructure at the local level. So those things that we're responsible for providing mm. and we work towards a sequencing plan so that there's, um, uh, you know, reasonable um, certainty about when those items will be delivered. So that might be things like local parks, um, you know, the, the a bike trail, uh, a community facility, a swimming pool or something like that. So those are the things that you'd find in the development contributions plan. And that's also on our website and it's, it's okay. It's digestible. You could have a look at it. It's, it's, um, it's okay to work through. At the state level, they have special infrastructure contributions and a plan that goes with that. So for Wilton, there's um, significant um, amounts of infrastructure and I need to just, I'll just check the number and I'll put it in the chat in a sec. Um, That's 650 million, I think. Okay, Tony? thanks. Thank you, Ben. Uh, wonderful. Yeah, so there's $650 million worth of state infrastructure that's been identified in the draft SIC for Wilton. Um, you may be aware that Wilton was established as a growth area on the basis of no cost to government. Now, obviously, that's, a, that's an interesting term. But what that means 
in principle is that the developers are required to fund that infrastructure. There are major items that of course the state will fund, but the developers need to fund this, the regional infrastructure that's specifically supporting the Wilton Growth Area. Now there, there is also another document which is also on a website, um, which we worked with the state government on, and it's an infrastructure phasing brochure for Wilton. It's a, a glossy brochure and it provides indicative um, infrastructure at both state and local level in five year grabs. It, it isn't um, down to the level of detail, say for example, it provides for uh, 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 land for a school, but it doesn't actually go through and tell you when the school's going to be built and operational, but it gives you a good uh, overview of the sort of infrastructure that's um, planned for Wilton. It is a huge task to plan for a growth area and it's really important that we get that right and it certainly has been a strong focus of this council and I imagine it will be a very strong focus of the next council as well. We've established a pretty close working relationship with the state because that's how we're going to get the best outcomes and we've, we've had um, I think a lot of air time with the state and they've been very open to um, coming and meeting with our councillors and we at officer level meet uh, regularly with the um, state um, council plan, uh, state planners. Um, so look, we, we don't have all the answers yet, but we do know that um, that planning framework is firmly in place and a funding um, source is part of that planning as well. So um, just to add to that as well, Brendan, um, the elected council has the ability also to advocate, to lobby um, directly to ministers, to um, to other, other levels of government as well. So um, for example, actually last night, council met, council last night um, approved a, um, or resolved to um, write to the government to ask for the population trigger points as to when some of that infrastructure would be delivered. Um, and then what that means effectively is we write a letter, yes, uh, but then um, myself, Tony, uh, Tony's team also work with the government agencies to bring forward that, um, that infrastructure investment. So if you're talking about um, fire stations, so as part of the development, there is land for a fire station and, and plans for um, that on-site um, police station, I can't remember exactly. Um, so I suppose there's a few possible ways. One of them is it gets con um, contained in the state infrastructure contribution and delivered that way. Otherwise, there is uh, an opportunity for council to work with the state government, with the federal government and lobby to see that sort of thing delivered. Does and I might, just, I might just add just one more that, uh, to that, um, Ben, if, if I may. Um, there is also another mechanism whereby infrastructure is delivered and it's through um, a thing called a planning agreement. It usually has the word voluntary planning agreement front of that and so that's where the uh, the developers um, enter into an agreement with council or with the state government to bring forward some of that infrastructure so they will then fund that infrastructure and they will deliver that infrastructure or pay a contribution towards it towards its delivery so that's another mean means whereby infrastructure can be delivered there have been a lot of changes over the last few months through the contributions framework and we're still working through what those changes will mean for council but it is designed to ensure that it's a streamlined um, approach to the delivery of infrastructure that it's fair and it delivers what communities need. If I might be able to add to Ben, if that's Go okay. One thing that we do do uh, on the ground is we do a lot of studies, a lot of gathering of evidence and data and through our engagement processes with the local community, Brendan, and uh, getting that feedback so we can ground truth what's actually happening at a local level for state and federal government to understand what the issues are and what the needs are. And um, we bring that back to council in the form of our council reports and briefing sessions, which also helps add to the advocacy uh, role that we have. So we're able to provide an evidence-based argument um, and also advocacy approach to what the needs are for Wollandilly 
We also have um, partnerships in place with other councils um, and we can advocate on a regional level for what's needed regionally as well to ensure that uh, Wallandilly is not forgotten on a regional basis as well. Thanks, Ali. Does that address your question, Brendan? Uh, yeah, I didn't mean to ask such a loaded question, to be honest. It was just, it was more, it was, um, it was more, you know what I mean? It's, it's so effectively, we don't have to really offer it, but it's more, that was my next question. What you're saying is, you know, so when do you decide these services are going to go in? Because hospitals don't go up overnight, you know what I mean? And neither do police stations, they take time. So, you know what I mean? So off the top of my head, I worked out if we're going to, what, uh, 108,000 by 2036, that's 3,600 people per year on average. Uh, you know, so when when do you decide, okay, this is this this is the marker, you know what I mean? But you've obviously already addressed that as well. And like I said, I'm probably just getting ahead of myself. So, yeah, like I said, no, just, just curious. So. No, not at all, Brendan. In fact, um, it's something that all of the community should have an interest in because all the community will benefit from those new services and facilities. And in terms of hospitals, we don't have a hospital on the horizon with the state government, but we haven't given up on that. And we're continuing mm -hmm. to advocate to the state for a hospital. There were two parliamentary inquiries last year into um, hospital services or medical services in the southwest of Sydney and also at regional, uh, remote and rural uh, medical services and facilities and they both highlighted the gap and we you we, we've um, made submissions in fact Ali appeared at uh, at the inquiry um, and uh, made her her point on behalf of Wallandilly that we needed um, the state to start thinking about a hospital out this way so uh, we'll continue to advocate for that and as the population grows then we grow more evidence towards that demand. Yeah, like I said, the main concern was how do, how do we address things obviously beyond our control, you know what I mean, for what you're saying there, it's, you know, rates and rubbish, but it's like it's, there's so much more to a community than just rates and rubbish, you know what I mean, rates, roads and rubbish. Um, so yeah, but no, yeah, thank, thanks for that. That was it. Uh, good question. Great question. Uh, is there any other questions um, from any of our attendees tonight? I'm sorry to say I can't see you all. So if you do want to raise your question, um, please take your microphone off um, and jump on in. Okay, I might just pause for a second longer. Uh, if not, um, then obviously we've um, provided you a huge amount of information tonight. Um, what I might let you do is digest it, have a think about it. Um, you're welcome to come back to us uh, as always. Uh, with any questions on any of the issues we've raised tonight. Um, as Matt said, we'll make sure that the presentation given this evening is circulated um, to all the attendees. Um, I understand there are a number of people as well who couldn't make it tonight who we provided with the recording um, of the session too. So if you guys have any questions, um, you're welcome to um, send them in to us as well. Um, and as I said earlier, um, you're welcome to um, contact my, e my EA if you'd like to make a time to um, come and see me one-on-one -on -one to have a talk about what your priorities are and any further questions you have about the operations of council and the role of a council law. If you have any questions, probably the best thing to do is to email them directly as well to governance at wallandilly.nsw.gov.au uh, and we'll endeavour to get back to you as quickly as we can. So um, before I wrap up, um, just want to check once more that there's no further questions. No, Brendan wins a prize. Great work, mate. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, everyone, then, for coming along. We might wrap it up early tonight. I'll give you back that half an hour um, time to, you know, go jump on and watch Survivor or jump on Netflix, whatever it is that you manage to do in, in, in lockdown these days. Um, as I said at the start, um, in my view, this is a really, really exciting time um, to be at Wallandilly. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, uh, wonderful people. Um, we have a really highly engaged workforce, a whole lot of people um, who work for Wallandilly who are passionate about our local community and really want to make it a better place. Um, we're really looking forward to, to welcoming our new council. Um, I wish you all the very, very best um, through, the, um, through the election period in your campaigning um, and your vote gathering. Um, and for those that are successful, I look forward to really working closely with you to deliver on some fantastic outcomes for the Wallandilly community. So thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Um, really appreciate it. Um, I wish you well. Um, stay safe. 
and I'll see you hopefully in person one of these days soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.